Daria, thank you for this interview for the GeoPost. And can you tell us the uh, whole situation now in Ukraine? Um, thank you for inviting. And um, it's very hard to say how it is now. The only thing I can confirm that there is no safe place in Ukraine right now because Russia has decided just to terrorize Ukraine and they, they've been shelling um, small towns, villages, big city, civilians on purposely. Uh, because they want to threaten Ukrainians to force the government, to force the president to surrender. Um, and um, I left Kyiv in early March because uh, Russia was shelling it very intensively and it was very scary. Since then, Kyiv is more or less safe, I would say but it's a little bit too soon to come back because I see every day that civilians die in all regions of Ukraine, also in Kyiv. And my parents live in the occupied area. Um, on, the, on, one, on one side, I'm happy that the Ukrainian army is bombing the depots and the military bases, but um, on the other hand, I'm very concerned because my parents live right next to those military bases. And when the weapon detonates, you never know where, uh, where it will fly and where it will land. So basically the situation is very complicated because I see how Europe is tired of the war in Ukraine, but we do not have the chance to get tired of this war. What is to be neighbor with Russia? You know, as a person who grew up in Russia, uh, I spent my childhood in Russia because my dad is originally from there. Uh, we live kind of on the border with Russia and I always felt that arrogance towards my nation from my family, Russian family. We, I grew up with them, we ate at the same table, we slept in the same bed, but now they call me Nazi because uh, they watch too much TV and I saw this um, development of their propaganda throughout Putin president, Putin's presidency, uh, how my relatives became more and more aggressive towards us. Like any time we arrived, uh, it, it was only 150 kilometers or something. Uh, once we crossed the border, the Russians were like so arrogant towards us, they just, first they said to us, so you're still in our gas. <laughs> like, like us personally, no then why do you learn Ukrainian language? Uh, because it's the language of my country. Ah, forget about it, nobody will need it, you should stick with Russia. And then in 2014, it was beyond. Uh, they, were, they became so aggressive that we cut ties with our Russian family. Uh, there were like just a couple of people in, in my dad's family who were still in touch with, the, with him. But in February, in, in February 2022, we uh, even stopped um, contacting them because they said that the war was fake and uh, that I was making up this challenge in Kyiv, it was not Russia. And then my parents uh, stopped talking to all my Russian family. So basically it's very hard to live in such a matrix, so to say, when people do not even uh, realize what is happening. They just watch TV. Uh, they don't have money to leave the region. They live all their life in the same village, in the same city, in the same region. And they do not believe that some other life exists. When I went to study in Germany, all my Russian family said like, the European Union will fall apart soon, so forget about the European Union. And they didn't believe that life in the European Union was fine and that people were kind to me, not just as they imagine, if you're a foreigner, they, everybody, nobody cares about you. That was not true. Um, so it's very hard to, be, to live with such a neighbor because you cannot be rational with them. They are always irrational. They are not analytical and they are very, very uh, arrogant and aggressive towards Ukrainians. How Russian propaganda is using that Ukraine crisis and invasion to make uh, more propaganda in Ukraine <laughs> and other states? 
I don't even know how to it, how to make more propaganda because what ha they have been doing for at least two decades, it's already too much. Um, they just lie, and since their people do, do not want to do not want to read something else, they just this is a drug basically. Uh, they show like they are these drug dealers on TV. They want more hatred, more excitement, more talks on uh, more like uh, aggressive talks. And people um, they get infected by this drug, and they turn on TV just to show how uh -huh, more, more fight, more. For them, it's exciting because people in Russia, believe me, I spent half of my life in Russia, and I know how it is. It's, I'm not talking about Moscow or Saint Petersburg. I'm, I'm talking about uh, reg small regions of Russia. They really do not know what to do except for watching TV. And they do believe it. And when I try to like, ask them questions, nobody knows the answer, but they just try to speak same um, slogans as on TV. That's it. They use this propaganda. They have so much money, the Kremlin, for propaganda. and. The European Union still sends them too much money buying their oil and gas, and they can they can bribe anyone basically anyone in Europe uh, to talk uh, to talk propaganda and to spread it. They are very powerful with this, uh, and the, if you do not fight it, and it's very hard to fight it, you need more money to fight it because if they spread one like disinformation, just a little piece of disinformation, you need more resources to fight it. Because people already doubt. To make them, to convince them, you need, once you convince them, they have spread 10 more pieces of disinformation. And people just, the, the, the purpose of it is to make you, to make you doubt. And that's it. Uh, how Russia and Putin uh, use the Orthodox Church in Ukraine? They, they've been using the Orthodox Church for a long time. As I remember, even in Lugansk in 2014, uh, they, sp they spread propaganda in the church and they even baptized the guns to go and kill Ukrainians. Uh, this time, um, well, the, our Ukrainian state, they tried to fight uh, the Russian church in Ukraine. It's still popular with the Eastern, Euro Eastern Ukrainians. Uh, and what I read, what I saw in the first weeks of the war, that Russia tried to organize Terroristic attacks in uh, in the church, Russian church, Russian Orthodox churches, to show that Ukrainians uh, kill their own civilians uh, who just come to pray and they're innocent and just because they want to pray in the Russian church. But thank God they prevented it uh, because Russian church is very well. Thank God that Ukrainian. Thank God. <laughs> thank God that Ukrainians are not very religious in this case and not all Ukrainians are Orthodox, that's why the church is not so influential. But still, people who go to church, uh, they're inf infected by this propaganda, I mean, Russian propaganda, who, because it's still, whatever they do, whatever our government does, it's still pretty popular in the East. And Maria, why did you choose Kosovo? Um, well, unlike my colleagues here, we are now six people from Ukraine, it's not my first time here. For all other journalists, it's the first time in Kosovo. My first time was in 2011. Uh, I studied then in Vienna, um, Eastern, Southeastern Studies, and I learned Albanian there. I still cannot speak well. Uh, and I got interested with this situation, war situation, because I remember that in Ukrainian media, they described it completely different. And I was so curious about it. Like why, why, why we knew the different story. And I came here, I spoke to many people here, and I realized that I was also a victim of uh, Russian propaganda, so to say, and Serbian propaganda. Uh, and then I came back over and over again to see, to, to travel here. I've been to Mitrovica. Uh, this time I was back uh, to see my feelings, like, because first time I was in Mitrovica before our war, and it, it felt completely different. Now I was like two weeks ago, and now, is, now my perception has changed about Mitrovica and everything that happened there. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not romantizing it anymore as I did. So, um, 
I always have, I was always curious about the place and I always wanted to be back and to stay here for longer than a week or two to speak to more people, to see, um, to see how life has changed after the war and what people went through. But what I see now that Ukraine is going through the same war as Albanians and Kosovo did. <laughs> Can you compare uh, Russian influence in Serbia? How is function? Did you know about that? And can you compare with the uh, propaganda in Ukraine? Well, it's the same. Um, even when I went to the university, it was a long time ago, uh, I, I remember how I prepared one essay on uh, Russian-Serbian friendship, how it started and everything. It started like three, 300 years ago when Russia once helped uh, Serbia against, uh, in, against, in, in the war against Turkey, I believe. And then they just became like Slavic brothers, and then this myth um, uh, was born. And still, they, they still believe they're like Orthodox brothers, and nobody else in the world understand them. They just have to stick together and spread their uh, disinformation together, basically. Um, Serbia was doing absolutely the same what Russia is doing, but fortunately, they do not have so much money as Russians. But Russians still help them to spread this uh, disinformation. And unfortunately, it's absolutely the same. It's absolutely the same what Serbia did and still doing and what Russia has been doing for decades. They're using same mechanisms, same tools, same lies. Do you have any ma message for Balkan people, <laughs> Balkan states, how to protect from <clears throat> Russian influence, propaganda and disinformation and, and other influences? Um, it's very hard because uh, Russia has as I said, Russia has too much money and they, they are not greedy. They are greedy to invest this money in education, in medical system, in their citizens, but not uh, war or propaganda. It's very hard. Uh, this is the main, the main task for journalists to tackle this propaganda. You always have to verify your sources. And if you see some news, you have to see where it comes from and you have to compare. And if you know people who live in that place, it's better to ask people directly but what I uh, see even on social media that Russia, Russia is still using a lot of bots and uh, you can click on their uh, on their profiles and they're empty or you see that they just uh, they just post and keep posting lots of Russian news and then you can understand that it's just a Russian bot and it was a funny story on, on, on the day when Russia proclaimed independency of LNR and DNR and I know my parents live there, I know everything about the region. And one American uh, socialist, as he said, leftist, he was like, oh, finally, these people are free from this Nazi regime. And I clicked on him and I saw that he looked like a bot. And I was like, let me see. I was like, what Nazi regime? Ukrainians, they've, they've been genociding uh, Russians there for like eight years. And so I'm originally from there. I'm a Ukrainian. What what else can you say? Like, leave the person, leave people there uh, to celebrate. And it was 11 p.m. and he kept sending me photos of how they kind of celebrate in the independence. And I know there was a curfew. People were not allowed to go outside at that time. And I said there is a curfew. They cannot be celebrating it right now. But you know, for me it was clear because I know the situation and people who read it they do not know it and they start doubting. That's the, that's the problem. And finally, I see now that many people in like in Western media, they already know their bots. And anytime Western media posts something on Ukraine, they say like, Russian bots, we are waiting for you. At least they understand. Uh, because even like one year ago, it was difficult to imagine that, for example, Germans or Dutch or French people or like Americans would distinguish the bots and the real people. So uh, at least now people learn how to divide, you know, this disinformation and normal information. And uh, for people who consume information, it's very, it's, it's critical to be analytical and to compare what other sources print, not just, you know, and then you click on the source and and you open the source and there is nothing, you know, it's just made up, made up piece. So it's better to, to read uh, um, papers you trust. And then if, if you doubt it, just find a person from there and ask. That's it.